Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to A Conversation With. I'm your host, Kelly Cruz, and today we have an extraordinary woman with us that we'll be talking to. She has an illustrious career and a very demanding career on her resume, but what her biggest battle has been is a fight with breast cancer. She's a 10-year survivor. Welcome to our show, Patricia Brown. Thank you, Patricia, Kelly. Patricia, thank you for joining us today. I'm thrilled. You are amazing. First of all, you do not look like you're battling cancer. That's what a good makeup job will do for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Now, I've never felt bad, and I've never looked ugly, but what goes in, inside my body is not a pretty picture. You've been battling it since 2005, is that right? That's correct, May 10th. Let's talk about your history before the battle started. Mm -hmm. You have a very long career as the president and CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation here yes. in the Mid-South. Tell me a little bit about that and all your experiences granting wishes to children who had very bad illnesses mm -hmm. and most office were, often were facing death. Yes. Make-A-Wish Foundation is an organization that brings hope, strength, and joy into families' lives. And for 12 years, I was honored to serve as their president and CEO. And I was able to be a part of over 2,000 wishes fulfilled and about $25 million raised. It's not an easy task to go into a person's home where there's a child that is facing a life-threatening illness. It's a family in crisis. And you learn a lot about that and the culture and the, the spirituality of families. And it, and it became an opportunity for me to learn, not only for myself, but for other people, of how to cope and deal with tragedy and, and scary situations. Um, it was the most fulfilling job ever to be able to look at a child that was sad and see that magic come into the mix and they were glad. And the parents were always so grateful. I, it, it truly was a privilege. And then it became a passion. And then it became a full-time, lifetime, 24-7 job. And for 12 years, uh, I totally enjoyed it and was happy to be a part of such an, an incredible organization. And I know through working with Make-A-Wish with you that you got very close to some of the patients. Tell oh, me I did. about one or two of those situations. <sighs> Well, we met doing a wish for a little girl named Jennifer Singler. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer really still lives with me in my heart. The, the ability for a child that was 12, turning 13, to have an impact on people, I learned right then it wasn't about how long you lived. It was what you did with your life while you were on earth. And that child was able to have more effect on people than some people that lived to be 80. It was, it was startling. And she had such a zest for life. And to the point that she came in my office frequently and made her own business cards. And when I'd leave town, she'd leave me notes that she needed to be left in charge. And then one day she came in and she was pulling all the hair off of her head. And, and I knew what her prognosis was. She... I don't think really ever understood that. She, kids don't understand life, so they don't really get death, but the adults do. And so mm -hmm. as I watched her pull the hair out of her, out of her scalp, I was like, Jennifer, go home and get that stuff off your head. You know, you're making a mess in my office. She came back the next day and she said, now who am I? And she had a wig on, much like the one I have right now, and red fingernails. And I looked at her and I said, I don't know, Jennifer Singler. And she said, no, I'm you. I want to be you when I grow up. Oh. That's when I knew my job mattered. Mattered a lot. Everything I said and did impacted these kids and the staff and the volunteers. And I'm not a perfect person, but I took it a lot more seriously after Jennifer Singler came, came and went. And it wasn't a good day when we all attended her funeral, but... I was at peace knowing that Jennifer left the earth in a better place because of her life. I want to read an excerpt from your manuscript. You're actually hoping yes. to get a book published yes. in the next year or so. 
Um, this quote says, she views her time at the Make-A-Wish Foundation as God's way of giving her on the life training that prepared her to fight her biggest battle. So when you look back at your years in Make-A-Wish, do you really feel so much that it really was a way to prepare for your own battle with cancer? Totally, 100%. It was like going to get a degree and understanding how to be your own advocate, how to have joy even in the bad times, how to make fun of yourself when you're bald and not looking so cute. <laughs> it did prepare me. And of course, I learned a lot about the terminology and the different diseases, childhood cancers. So much of what I've learned was through my time with these families, hearing their story over and over and again would give me new information. So when I had the opportunity to champion my own battle, I turned myself into my own project and my own, I became a grantor of wishes for myself and other people and had a lot of humor with it. And I was able to powerfully, with confidence, become my own advocate because I understood if I didn't speak up and I didn't learn and I didn't invest in myself, then my odds were not gonna be good. It's extraordinary because you really talk about in your manuscript let me just, you, you said actually, uh, then it hit you. You cried and wept for hours after you were told you had cancer and then remembered the seven habits of highly effective people have it too. Begin with the, begin with the end in mind. That, yes. that was a hard reality to take. It is, but again, through Make-A-Wish, I learned we're all terminal. Mm. And there's no way to know whether it's going to happen when you're two years old or when it, you're 20 or when you're 80 or 60. You don't know. So begin with the end in mind. And what I wanted to accomplish with my life, I needed to make sure that I stayed true to my own goals and wishes and pledged ahead. And I did. You really did. <laughs> I, did. I mean, I don't think a lot of people know that, that as soon as you had your mastectomy, then you had a staph infection after that, which had to be excruciating. I it, can't even it was imagine. The worst. Let's talk about that a second. Now, I mean, this, this is very rare that something like this would happen. I mean, you, you had your breast removed, basically. Mm -hmm. You had all this surgery. You were starting reconstructive surgery, True. correct? Yes. And then you find a staph infection in that location. Right. What was that like? Well, it was confusing at first because no one seemed to know what was going on. I just had a high fever I couldn't get rid of. There was no signs. The blood work didn't demonstrate any kind of infection, so it was confusing. And after about a week of running 103 fever, and then I had symptoms, which was my reconstructive breast was starting to bruise and ooze pus. Mm. It was like, okay, there's a bigger problem here. And thanks to friends, you being one of them, we uh, got me in the hospital and that was a week's stay and two surgeries of um, debris the area to the point my fist could almost fit in my chest wall. Oh. They did not think the wound would heal. And I went, oh yes it is. Cause I got the power of the Holy Ghost in me. And I went on a prayer campaign with friends and family across the country and it was wonderful after 30 days seeing a wound specialist in my bedroom because they had to debris it every other day, look at me because he was the guy that said it would maybe never heal and said, I've witnessed a miracle. Wow. I've never seen this in my 25 years of wound care, a, a wound like this healing. And I said, I told you. <laughs> and so that was my approach to everything was, no, it's in Jesus' hands. He's the determiner. I'm just a vehicle. You know, when you say this, a lot of times I hear you refer to your faith. Yes. And I've actually heard people who have had cancer say, shockingly, cancer has been a blessing yes. in my life. Yes. And obviously you think that. I do think that. I feel honored to uh, get the opportunity to do the journey of battling cancer. Uh, it is a gift, I think. I don't like it. I wish I didn't have it. It affects my life and lifestyle. It's not fun. It's not pretty. The drugs are, have interesting side effects that aren't very enjoyable. 
And um, that is not good. But what is good of it is it did increase my spirituality. It has impacted hundreds of other people's lives. Not just the people I meet in the chemo clinics, but I get written to by lots of people that say I made a difference in their life. And it's not me, it's, it's my battle, it's how I've championed it. And it's to glorify God because without that strength and that core belief that he has a plan and a purpose, he had the end in mind for me when I was born, that then this would just be a sickness. It's not, it's an opportunity. And I do seize it and have fun with it and make fun of myself. And if I die today, I'm all good. Well, I don't think you're going to be dying in time soon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, actually, recently, I mean, it's been recent that you got the word yes. flying from MD Anderson on a, a recent checkup that, you know, you were doing so much better. Right. And then you find in your paperwork flying back to, to Northwest Arkansas something about your brain right. in this paperwork right. that nobody caught. No. And so tell me about that. That's why you have to be your own advocate and get copies of all your, your clinical information so that you read it and understand it. Um, yeah, it's kind of shocking to be on a plane and it says there's an edema in the brain from the PET scan, they discovered that. And I'm like, edema in the brain? And seizures are possible and, and they recommended I have a brain MRI and nothing had been said. So, you know, you get off the plane, you make a phone call. Of course, they're not in my office, and it was a couple of days. By the time I got the word, I'd already scheduled my own brain MRI. And yes, went in, and here, here we're conquering the, the reoccurrence mats in my body, and, and then all of a sudden it's in my brain? Well, that's the goal of cancer, to get in your brain and kill you. So I was scared but it was like, okay, we just got to figure out what to do. So we, I did 15 rounds of brain radiation, took my hair, made me kind of halfway crazy and silly and goofy and dizzy, and they wouldn't let me drive for two months. So be, be alone, be in your home, can't drive, can't work. Mm. I said, I got to find a purpose. Change of life experience. So I started uh, finding different nonprofits that I could do some philanthropy with and, and strategic planning. And I could do that from home. I cannot not have a purpose. Energizer Bunny. Yes. <laughs> and, sure. and kind of goofy Energizer Bunny at times, but always fun and with a good end result. And thankfully, I'm good. But in May, when they tell me I might have months to live, it was time to plan my funeral. You know, I'm an event planner. I wasn't going to have a boring funeral. I had to get with it, you know, get on the stick. And so I did. I did all the prearrangements, got speakers lined up, got musicians lined up. You know, if I was only to live a few months, I was going to go out with a bang. But obviously, you passed that. And, I did. And didn't they call you a miracle again? Yeah, again. I've had numerous front row seats to miracles. So today... Yes. How are those brain tumors? They're almost gone. The, the tumors that were in my uh, lungs and the spots on my bones, they believe are totally inactive now. And then the spots in my brain are almost all gone, except for just a few, and they've all diminished in over, over half the size in the course of this last six months. How does this make you feel? blessed, very blessed and happy and joyous. And it gives me the energy and the attitude to continue to tell the story. I want people to understand there's more to life than death. That's, that's a given. But what are you doing every single day? Seize the day. You do seize the day. <laughs> I, want to, I want to hear, go back about your career because this woman's career looks like <clears throat> Uh, a life, I mean, a lifetime of somebody maybe a hundred years old. <laughs> I feel like it <laughs> But you started out being a dental hygienist years mm -hmm. ago, yes. and then you worked at Porter Lee Children's Home. Yes. Then you went to Make-A-Wish. Yes. There for 12 years? Yes. 12 years. Started the John Daly Make-A-Wish Golf Tournament. Yes. That is, is amazing. And then, even after you had the breast cancer, you actually toured 
with well, I was John touring Daly? with I had it, but I didn't know I had it. But I was touring with him and working exclusively for John with his charitable foundation. And um, it's kind of hard to be in a different city every week and then also fight breast cancer and be in the chemo clinic. So we discontinued the professional relationship. We're still good friends. And then later on, when I went to work for the Nationwide Tour, the PGA Tour event in Fort Smith, Arkansas, as their tournament director, I uh, recruited John to come back and, and work with me again. This time, I'm the director, and he's just a, just a golfer. <laughs> and let's talk about that, because really, uh, you are the only female to ever have that position in the nation, correct? Right, female tournament director. I did not realize when um, I got the position that was the case, and I went to the <laughs> their annual meeting, and I'm like, where's the other girls? So, you know, They said, no, you're it. You're the only one that's ever been hired out of a pool of men to be the female tournament director. My predecessor was a female, but she had um, promoted into the job, and I'm like, what? And then the different ladies that were um, support staff for the guys, they were coming up to me, and you broke through the ceiling, and maybe we'll have a chance, and I was like, wow. I mean, it wasn't like something I set out to do. I just needed a job in Arkansas, <laughs> and, were these and I was people, qualified. Were these people knowing of your breast cancer? No, no. Wow, did they ever find out? After, oh, yeah. After the oh, yeah, because uh, I started a new program called Pink on the Links. It was the only dedicated today in the PGA Tour history back a um, I mean, few years ago that they all came out in support of breast cancer awareness by wearing pink and during tournament play. That was a big thing. And it was re recognized by the Nationwide Tour as one of the best practices. And in the next year, I was able to go on stage after uh, being asked what qualified me to be a tournament director and explain to them and here, here's why. Branding, marketing, fundraising, and I'm creative. I came up with Pink on the Links. What you got? <laughs> wow. Again, you know, your, your, your manuscript that you're writing, Hope to Be, published soon into a book, you talk about um, at one point, you know, when you got your head shaved, that you looked in the mirror one morning and realized, <laughs> I am my dad. Yes. It's it, extraordinary when you look at this picture. Right. And finally figure out, I really do look like my father. Right. It's, it's another blessing. You know, I would have never known that if I didn't have hair. I was brushing my teeth and I went, I'm George Redden. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I went out and asked my brother, I was like, who do I look like? And he went, dad, but I won't <laughs> tell you because he's bald or almost bald, you know, and I'm like, oh my. And then I went and lived with my parents for six weeks while I did radiation therapy. Uh, back in 2005, and and I learned we we like the same food, we like the same TV shows, and I mean, it was again a blessing. I would have never gone as an adult to live with my parents for six weeks, and I would have not known how much I'm like my family. A blessing. You talk also. Um, about the devastation of losing your hair, but mm -hmm. you've actually had fun with that as mm -hmm. we talk about how you're the Energizer Bunny. Let's talk about some of those experiences. The henna crown? Yes. Well, okay, when everybody sees you with a bald head, they look at you so pitiful. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I don't want them to feel bad. And I don't want to feel bad and it's awkward. So I went and had my hair, my head tattooed not permanent, with henna, and it was a henna crown, and therefore people look at me differently, and they react differently, and I chanced it. I was at a concert, and I had a hat on, and I decided I'm just going to pull this hat off right here now and see what happens, and it was like I was the most popular person walking out of the ladies' <laughs> room. It was like, that is so cool. That is wonderful, and from then on, I realized, okay, let's do things with this, and make people laugh or smile or be amazed and not pitiful because I don't have any hair and I probably am sick. And I am sick, I mean, technically, I have a disease, but um, don't pity me. I mean, yeah, if you want to bring me a casserole, I'm all about it. <laughs> but, but don't feel sorry for me, I, uh, I'm happy. On, on your blog, you do a blog regularly yes. with the City Wire and yes. also you have a face Book page yes. that you blog on regularly, and you have people from all over the world yes. following you yes. and getting 
news from you and learning more about how to deal with cancer, mm -hmm. how to have humor yeah. during cancer. Um, you, you said you even have people from like South Africa yes. contacting I have, you. I have a great lady that I've never met, of course. She's not been here and I've not been there. but And we chat sometimes at 3 a.m. when I can't sleep. And um, it's amazing. I feel like I know her. I feel like I know a lot of these people. And, you, know, you, you hang up a telephone call from someone that responds to a blog and and right before you hang up, the lady is in Pennsylvania and she says, for the first time I have hope. Mm. See, it's a blessing and it's an opportunity and it's a calling. I'm Helpy Helperson and I'm a fixer and I want to share everything I have learned and be helpful and an encourager to people. I don't care if it's cancer or some other disease or a family problem. There is always hope and you just can't let Satan steal your joy. Well, I remember you telling me one time you were getting a little bored. You were <laughs> how many years into your remission? I think like five years, seven, seven years. Yes. Seven years in remission, and you actually remember praying and saying, God, I'm getting a little bored. Right. Give me a project. Right. And then tell me what happened almost immediately thereafter. Well, right then I was afraid. I went, oh my gosh, he's gonna let me go through this again. And sure enough, I mean, I knew when I got the phone call after my routine blood work um, that my, it appeared that my tumor markers were telling them that the cancer might have come back. And generally when you um, have breast cancer, it doesn't come back in your breast. Your breast is gone. It comes back somewhere else. And in my case, it was my hip, my right hip, and, uh, and my lymph nodes in my lung. And a lot of people don't know that breast cancer does not ever become another cancer. It's just that the breast cancer has morphed a little bit and gone into these other organs and, right. of course, eventually into your brain. Yes. It, when it gets into your lymph nodes, those cells circulate through your system. That's why you do chemotherapy, mm -hmm. is to treat the full body and try to kill all those cells off. And uh, we were very successful in 2005. And there was no evidence of disease and then seven years later there was. Well here you are looking a picture of health and you've beaten the odds so many times, been told a miracle so many times. Right. Where do you see your life going in the next five to ten years? Well God obviously has the end in mind and I just kind of float along with him. However, it seems that I've become a requested public speaker, which was one of my wishes and dreams and prayers when I had my reoccurrence to be a national public speaker, and I get to do that um, on a big stage in front of lots of people and and stomp my foot and tell people to work harder and quit your whining. <laughs> and, and I just have a joyful time in sharing with people as a speaker. I also didn't really understand that I had the talent of writing until mm -hmm. I started blogging. And I've been a blogger for two and a half years and, and I am able to also blog on other publications besides the citywire.com. But um, that led into coming off the stage one time and being a blogger and a marketing group came up to me and said, you need to write a book. Well, that was also another prayer that I had two and a half years ago was to be a writer and write a book and tell my story because I think it's entertaining and informative. It's very entertaining. It's not boring. I don't do boring real well. Um, and it's also a tribute to a lot of people that have helped me through this. I, I mean, I'm one person. I can't do this just by myself. And I've had friends and girlfriends and guy friends and family and doctors and nurses. I mean, I've had a team of people that have allowed me to get to this point to where I can broadcast through this this show and through my speaking and writing. And then I spend a lot of time with philanthropies. I'm a fixer, I'm sort of a nonprofit doctor. I go in when they have a problem, I, I diagnose them, create a, a strategic plan or a, a treatment plan, <laughs> and then we get to work and make the world a better place, move the needle, make a difference. That's my goal. Well, with hopefully your book being published soon, um, for all the viewers out there who are either battling cancer or may find out near in the future that they're gonna have cancer. So if you had one thing to say to these ladies, what would you say? Get a mammogram. Don't be always satisfied with that. 
go get a diagnostic mammogram, and you have to become your own advocate. Do not put your head in the sand. Take care of yourself. Get healthy now before you get the diagnosis. That's one of the, the key things that has created the opportunity for the miracles to happen is that I was healthy to begin with. Never ever sick, didn't have diabetes, no heart problems. So therefore my range of options from a treatment standpoint is wider. And then when you have a gut and you're feeling, a feeling in your gut that you, you um, something didn't right, get a second opinion. I did, and if I hadn't, I wouldn't have been, I would not be sitting here right now. That's huge. And you also yes. said, I believe in your manuscript to see an oncologist, very important. Very first thing you do is, after you do your mam yearly mammograms is if you do, or they think, even think there's a possibility of cancer, go to an oncologist first thing and let him be your quarterback. He will be your friend for the rest of your life because this, just because they have no evidence of disease or going to remission or say you're cancer free, those cells were in your body at one time and they can come back. Well, I am a living example of that. Yes, you are. So your oncologist is your best friend. You know, you can like your surgeon and love your plastic surgeon, but your oncologist is the key. Very good words. Patricia Brown, thank you for being on our show tonight with us. You've really given an insight into what it's like to have cancer. We appreciate you so much being on our show and sharing that. Well, you're most welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>